Today is the beginning of Holy Week. During these seven days, we will move deeper and deeper into the story of our faith. And it's disturbing, it's challenging, it's emotional. You heard how it, end, how it ends eventually on Friday and on Saturday. Jesus is dead and buried in a tomb. Because of the nature of this week, I think it's important for us to be really clear that God is with us. And God wants us to move through this tough week, but not alone. So I want to do something I've done before. I'd like for you to close your eyes and repeat after me. Close your eyes. I see and receive, I see and receive. The, love and joy the love and joy with which God gazes at me, with which God gazes at me. As, I gaze at God. as I gaze at God. So, was Jesus naive and reckless, or was he courageous and faithful? I mean, he knew what he was getting into. He knew that the Roman soldiers were on duty during the season of the, the celebration of Passover. And it was their duty, it was their primary purpose to be there to make sure there were no uprisings. So the soldiers were on high alert. Anything popping up here or there, they, would, they were supposed to squash it, to put it down, because they wanted no rebellion. They wanted no uprising of the Jews, of the people coming to visit and to honor that sacred time. So he knew by his entrance into Jerusalem as a king, as a peasant king on a donkey, on a colt, all of the references to David and to prophets in past time, Jesus knew what he was doing. And he knew that he would face huge resistance from the Roman Empire, the domination force and system of that day. And he knew that he would be killed. Not only did he challenge the oppression of the Roman Empire, but he also challenged the authorities in the temple, because they were not being holy people. They were taking advantage of the poor just like the Roman Empire was. The people in the temple were charging too much for the sacrifices. The sacrifice really wasn't what, the, what Jesus saw as, a, as an appropriate representation and activity in worshiping God. The temple was not being fully what it was supposed to be, which is a place of worship, a sacred place. And so for him to go into that temple, cause a huge commotion, turn things over, as it says in scripture, he frightened those scribes and high priests and those people who were in charge because they knew that he was a challenge to their authority. And they wanted to kill him. Jesus was aware of that. Jesus was definitely not reckless or naive. He knew what he had to do, what he chose to do, and what God called him to do. So he was courageous in stepping up and faithful to the God in whom we believed and whom he believed and from whom he came. He was called to be an instrument of justice in his time in that sacred city, an instrument of God's justice. So, so what do we mean by God's justice? I mean, there's lots of ways we talk about justice this day and age. Lots of ways people talk about God's justice. What, what is the biblical understanding of God's justice? Well, I'd like to give you some guidelines, and there are others as well, and I'd give you something to talk about. 
Because it's important for us to understand what's God's, what is God's justice. Well, here's one. God's justice is for the common good, for all of us. For the common good, for the greater community. Because God loves all of us. Not this group or that group, more or less. Because God loves us all, it's for the common good. God's justice is balanced because God doesn't play favorites. God loves everyone equally. Granted, the more, you know, it's a happier scene, the more faithful we are in our spiritual journeys, and it's a tough and, and, and rocky time when we lose our way and have to be called back into faithfulness. But basically, God, God loves us all equally. God's justice stands against those who dominate and lifts up those who are oppressed. This is the theme throughout the Old Testament. All the prophets of the Old Testament, that's what they did, is they stood against the dominating force which was there, whether it was Babylon or whatever the, whatever the force might be that kept down the poor and the Jews and the outcast. God, God stands against that. God wants us to stand against domination. And to, be li and to lift up those who are oppressed. God's justice is grounded in the truth of the heart, of the heart and of the soul, more than the truth of the mind. Granted, when we go through making decisions about our actions, our, mind is, our minds are definitely engaged. But in addition to that, we're called to listen to our heart, to listen to God, as we discern what is justice. And finally, God's justice is healing because God wants all of humanity and creation to live in harmony and peace. The purpose of God's justice is not to kill, it's not to divide, it's not to defeat, it's not to argue. The purpose of God's justice is to bring healing into a community, into relationships, because God wants us to live in harmony and peace. The challenge, of course, is how do we get there? On April the 4th, 19, 18, 1865, the year after, the day, the day after Richmond fell, President Abraham Lincoln visited Richmond. And I think, I think Abraham Lincoln was a man of prayer. I think he was a believer. I think he was a man who, who wanted to do the right thing for humanity. I think he was a reconciler. I think he liked to have different types of people in his cabinet. I think that his big picture is one of the common good. And when he visited Richmond, it wasn't to go there as a victor or to satisfy something. He went there to connect to those who had fallen, to those who had experienced extreme pain. And if he had lived, I'm sure there would have been a greater sense of re rebuilding the community of our nation. I think he was an instrument of God's peace and God's justice. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. died April the 4th 1968, almost 50 years ago. He also was a man of prayer, a person of prayer, a believer. He also believed in the common good, what's good for the whole nation. He also fought, worked, preached, acted for those who are oppressed, especially through segregation, through racial injustice. And, and I think Martin Luther King was an instrument of God's peace and God's justice. Yesterday, hundreds of thousands of people, a lot, a lot of young people, marched in Washington, D.C. and in 800, loca 800 other locations throughout the world for the purpose of common sense gun reform. And I think that those people marching, those people speaking up, 
want to work on behalf of the common good, namely that students in high school and middle school don't get killed or at concerts. I think they're working for the good, for the common good of people throughout this nation. Namely, that we do something about gun violence in this nation. Do not murder. The question, of course, is how do we live into that dream of God's justice for us? Because people have different ideas and different ways to get there. It's very interesting in this story that includes Jesus coming in and challenging the Roman Empire through his march into Jerusalem, and Jesus moving into the temple to challenge the authorities in the temple, taking a stand for justice. It's very interesting at the end of that reading, at the end of that reading, he talks about three things. The necessity to keep the faith. Whenever we are in struggle or in conflict, to remember where we are in spiritual journeys, either as a community or individuals, to stay focused on our faith in Jesus Christ. Second, we are, we are reminded to pray. To pray as if God is listening, as if God will make a difference in our communities and in, in, in our lives to pray in a way that softens our hearts as well as maybe other hearts so that we will get to the place that we can listen to each other and love each other and reach some sort of solution for God's justice. And the third listed at the, at the end of that reading in your bulletin is to forgive each other, to forgive others so that you may be forgiven as well. In this reading for today, there is a wonderful blend of how God has called us to act for justice and to love as compassionate members of the body of Christ. And both are important. What we pray is that all of us have the wisdom and the faith and the sensitivity and the love to find where we fall on that mix of justice and compassion. And there is an answer. There is an answer which doesn't involve disintegrating into nothing but stalemate and argument. I'd like for you to turn to your bulletin now for, for that prayer, that prayer for justice. And I want us to say that together. Because this is a good prayer, and it talks about heart. You see the colleague for justice? Let's say that prayer together. Grant, O oh God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart, and especially the hearts of the people of this land, that barriers which divide may crumble. Suspicions disappear and hatred cease. That our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen means so be it. <laughs>